Most plastic water and soda bottles are made from a polymer called PET, which stands for polyethylene terephthalate. It's a very useful and versatile plastic, but every year millions of tons of it are produced, and it represents a huge amount of waste. A small portion of it is recycled though, and it's generally done in two main ways, either mechanically or chemically. When it's done mechanically, it's collected, shredded, cleaned up, and melted. Then, from a liquid, it can be extruded, spun into fibers, and so on. In general though, it can't be used to remake drink bottles because there's often contamination that makes it not safe for food. When it's recycled chemically, it isn't just melted and reshaped, and it's instead degraded. These degradation products can then be used to build into new polymers. I found a book that outlined two common chemical methods, and I wanted to try them out. In the first one, it's used to make polyurethane foam for things like insulation, and in the other one, it's used to make fiberglass resin. For this video, I'm going to be focusing on the polyurethane one, but in the future, I will cover the other procedure. As a quick side note, for those of you who are waiting, the last part of my Prussian Blue series should be out in the next couple weeks. I originally wanted it to be this video, but I ran into some problems that ended up delaying it. In any case, for the first part of this project, these are all the chemicals that I used. The ones labeled Sigma were purchased well from Sigma, the two black ones were from eBay, and the castor oil was from my local pharmacy. Besides the chemicals, I of course also needed a plastic bottle. Pretty much all water and soda bottles should work, but it is a good idea to check that it's actually PET. This is very easy to do by just looking for the recycling number, and it should either say 1, or sometimes it's even just literally written PET. I took off the label, cleaned off all the glue, and then chopped it into pieces using scissors. I also weighed it out, and in total, there were 22.5 grams of plastic here. Into a flask, I added some boiling chips that I got by smashing a porcelain plate. Then I added all the plastic, which actually ended up kind of being a pain because the pieces kept getting stuck in the neck. This was totally my fault though, and it was just because I didn't cut them up small enough. In any case, when it was eventually all inside, I added magnesium acetate and manganese carbonate, which were the catalysts for the reaction. Then on top of all of this, I poured in 15 milliliters of diethylene glycol. To get the reaction going, I needed to heat it to its boiling point. So I placed the heating mantle below it, and above it I attached a condenser column to prevent any vapors from escaping. I cranked on the heating, and over the course of an hour, the plastic slowly disappeared. PET plastic is a long repeating chain of ethylene glycol and terephthalic acid groups, all bound together by ester bonds. And what I'm doing here is breaking apart this chain in a process called transesterification. With strong heating and in the presence of the manganese catalyst, the diethylene glycol starts to attack the PET. It competes with the ethylene glycol for the terephthalic acid, and it's able to kick it out and replace it. This makes a new ester bond between the terephthalic acid and the diethylene glycol, and the PET chain is broken at this point. As the reaction continues, this happens in more and more places, and the polymer is slowly degraded. After about an hour, I took away the heating mantle to check its progress. As it cooled a bit, it became cloudy because some of the plastic was separating from the solution. This told me that the polymer chains were still too big, so I boiled it for another hour. This time, it cooled all the way to room temperature without any cloudiness. For the next step, I had to get rid of the manganese catalyst, and I was originally planning to filter it. However, I found that it was a lot easier to just reheat the resin to make it a bit more liquidy, and then to pour it off into another flask. By doing this carefully and slowly, I was pretty much able to separate out all of it. When it was all in the new flask, I let it fully cool to room temperature. Then I poured in 77.4 grams of castor oil, and I added a stir bar. I tried to set up my stir plate and to mix this all together, but I ran into some problems. The stir bar that I used was too big, and the mixture was way too thick, so it kind of just got stuck and did nothing. I thought that maybe it would work with a smaller one, so I took this one out using a magnet and dropped in the other one. Not only was this swap kind of a mess, but it also didn't pay off at all. It was actually able to spin this time, but it was so slow that there was no hope in mixing anything. I ended up just having to do it the old-fashioned way, which was how I should have done it from the beginning. 
When I felt that I had a relatively even mixture, I put it back on the stand. Then into this, I poured my entire bottle of Tololine 2,4 diisocyanate, or just TDI for short. Just as a quick safety note, TDI is relatively toxic, especially by inhalation, so it's really important to work in a well-ventilated area. Anyway, right after adding it, I quickly swirled it around. Then, about 30 seconds later, when it looked nice and even, I put it back on the stand. What was good this time was that the isocyanate actually thinned it out enough that the stir bar was able to work. Over the next 20 minutes or so, the temperature slowly rose and it started to bubble. The TDI has two isocyanate groups and each of them can react with an alcohol to make a urethane. The castor oil that was added is almost entirely a triglyceride of ricinoleic acid and it can react in three places. Also, each fragment of the depolymerized PET can react on either end. With all these ingredients added together, the castor oil and the PET fragments start attacking the TDI. This builds a new polymer chain containing many urethane groups, and it's generally referred to as a polyurethane. An excess of TDI was used here though, so it didn't fully polymerize and most of the strands didn't get very long. A lot of them also have free isocyanate groups on the end, and you'll see in a bit why that's important. All the foaming that's happening here is from another reaction between the isocyanate and water. The water attacks the isocyanate, which leads to the formation of an amine and carbon dioxide gas. The amine that forms can then attack another isocyanate and polymerize things further. This reaction doesn't make urethane bonds though, and it instead makes disubstituted ureas. One final thing that I think is important to talk about is why I even added the castor oil. It didn't mention it at all in the procedure, and I couldn't find any info online, but I think it's because the depolymerized PET alone just makes bad quality polyurethane. The foam made from castor oil is a much higher quality though. So I think in industry, the general idea is to just use the recycled PET as a cheap additive to cut down on cost. When it's kept in relatively low percentages, maybe around 10 or 15%, it'll still give a high quality foam, but it's just cheaper to make. As the reaction continued, the temperature kept rising and it eventually peaked at 86 C. When this happened, the flask was placed into a vegetable oil bath that I had preheated to 120 C. The increase in temperature quickly kickstarted some more bubbling, but it wasn't nearly as vigorous as before. I kept it here for about an hour, and then I took it out of the bath and I put it in some cold water. In hindsight though, while it was still hot, I should have poured it into a beaker. The cooled resin was extremely thick, and it got completely stuck in the flask. To get it out, I had to invert it in a beaker, and blast it with my heat gun. It slowly gooed its way out of the flask, and I thought that it looked like really thick honey. After several minutes of working at it, it was all eventually out. So I got rid of the flask, sealed the top with some plastic wrap, and the pre-polymer was now ready. However, before I try making the foam with it, I'm just going to give a quick shout out to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Skillshare is an online learning community that offers lessons on almost everything, from drawing to running a business. Signing up for premium costs less than $10 a month, and it gives you unlimited access to all their classes, which at this point is over 21,000. In one of my recent videos, the one on Prussian blue, I made my own oil paint and I attempted to use it. As I expected, I wasn't very good, but it genuinely made me interested in learning how to paint and to draw in general. I've been using Skillshare for the past week or so to do this, and so far I honestly really like it. I personally think that I've improved quite a bit, and in a future video, if you notice that my drawing and stuff isn't terrible, well, this is the reason why. So with that being said, if you're interested in learning some new things and supporting my channel at the same time, you should definitely try out Skillshare. What's also great is that the first 500 people who sign up using my personalized link will get a two month free trial. Anyway, with that being said, let's get back to making the foam. To do this, I needed a few ingredients, and they're all shown here. The first step was to make a buffered catalyst solution by adding 7 grams of diethylaminoethanol, followed by 10 mils of 10% hydrochloric acid. I swirled it around a bit to really mix it up, and then I placed it on the side. 
In a plastic cup, I weighed out about 5 grams of the pre-polymer, and in the beaker on the right, I prepared the catalyst mixture. I added about half a mil of water, 2 drops of silicone oil, and 0.175 mils of the buffered catalyst that I just made. With everything added, I gave it a quick mixing, and I dumped it into the pre-polymer. I then stirred it around for a couple minutes, and it slowly got whiter and whiter due to the production of CO2 gas. When I felt like it was evenly mixed, I took out the spatula and I let the reaction do its thing. The initial reaction was between water and some of the unreacted isocyanate groups, which converted them to amines. It also produced CO2 gas, which caused it to slowly puff up. These amines then went on to attack other isocyanates, forming urea linkages. This caused the polymer chains to slowly increase in size, and for it to eventually solidify. This combination of CO2 production and polymerization is how a lot of polyurethane foams are made. When it was done, I thought it was going to be impossible to get out of the cup, but it was actually quite easy. I tried jamming my thumb into it, and it seemed relatively tough, but then it just kind of exploded. I took one of the pieces and crushed it in my hand, and it easily fell apart into a powder. Okay, so now that I knew my foam actually worked, I wanted to try molding it into something. So I whipped up a relatively large batch and started putting it into some silicone molds. I just bought the one on the left from Amazon, but I made the one on the right myself using a silicone kit. At the bottom of it, there's an imprint of a caffeine molecule, and I wanted to see if it would turn out. When it was all transferred over, I started a time lapse and I waited for about 30 minutes. When it was done, I started by demolding the caffeine one, and I saw that it kind of worked. It was actually able to get in and mold the molecule, but when I took it out, a portion of it just got stuck inside. Despite this though, I still kind of thought that it was cool. I then moved on to demolding the other pieces. The first one didn't have much to work with, but the other three had a lot of excess foam, so I was able to shape them using a razor blade. In the end, this was the final result, and I was pretty happy with how it all turned out. Although the majority of the reaction was over, it can take up to a month or longer for the polyurethane to fully cure. Because of this, strength testing it right after making it wasn't really fair, and it doesn't show the true strength of the polymer. So I waited a couple months and then tested it again, and the results were very different. I tried as hard as I could to jab my finger into it, and then to crush it in my hand, but basically nothing happened. I also tried flattening it, but that didn't really work either, so I just resorted to smashing it. It was able to take several good hits, and still kind of stay together. The foam here was definitely way stronger, and it really showed me why it was important to let things cure. Anyway, I think that's about it for this project. One thing I want you to keep in mind though, is that this was just one method of recycling PET to polyurethane, and there are a whole bunch of other ways that it could be done. It's possible to use many different catalysts, solvents, and even another alcohol instead of castor oil. A lot of these changes though, will alter the final properties of the polyurethane. For example, it's possible to make a foam that's instead soft and spongy, that can be used for things like cushions. The foaming process can even be inhibited altogether, so it instead forms a dense solid that can either be rigid or flexible. It's an incredibly versatile family of polymers, and I think I'm going to try exploring it in a bit more detail in a future video. And one other thing that I might try is redoing this prep, but without adding the castor oil. I honestly really don't know how it'll turn out, and I'm really curious to see what'll happen. As usual, a big thanks goes out to all my supporters on Patreon. Everyone who supports me can see my videos at least 24 hours before I post them to YouTube. Also, everyone on Patreon can directly message me, and if you support me with $5 or more, you'll get your name at the end like you see here.